Good morning. For those of you who do not know me or have never met me, which I'm sure there are many because every week at Springwell I see so many new faces that I haven't seen before and that so excites me. But um, my name is Karen and I am Scott's wife. <laughs> Scott and I were married in 1983 and six years later we were blessed with our first child, a daughter whom we named Emily. She's going to be sharing with us today, and I've been asked to introduce her. In 2011, we took Emily on her first international mission trip to the Dominican Republic. During that week, Scott and I saw her reactions when she was introduced to the culture and the way that she became engaged with the people and just embraced everything she experienced. We knew then that she was hooked. She began to ask questions about international missions and what that looked like. Could she really do this for more than just one week at a time? The next summer in 2012, she had her answer because she spent seven weeks working with several different ministries back in the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo. She then went to Guatemala with Springwell on two separate trips, and by this time, it's three years later, it's 2014, and Emily has four international mission trips totaling 10 weeks under her belt. And then we hear about the world race. This is a mission adventure where you travel to 11 countries in 11 months, and after learning more about it, I knew immediately that Emily would definitely become a world racer. She applied, was accepted, and began to fundraise what seemed like an impossible amount of money. That, however, turned out to be the easiest part of the race. In January of 2015, we took her to Atlanta. We met her squad members, and we listen to leaders share and talk about what we should expect as her parents. I have to tell you, I had such a peace about sending her off to do this, a peace that could only come from my heavenly father. We spent the next year praying for her and we anxiously waited to get an email or a text or very rarely to be able to Skype or FaceTime. And then, even before her 11 months were up, she began talking about her next step and what she was praying about. She wasn't even home yet, I thought. She sent us a web link and asked us to check it out and to help her pray about what God had for her next. We told her we would, and before we knew it, she was in her last month of the race and we were picking her up at the airport just in time for the holidays. That next step was G42 Leadership Academy located in Mijas, Spain. Its sole purpose is to train, inspire, and develop leaders who are passionate about giving their lives to the message of Christ. Once again, she applied and was accepted and began to do her fundraising so that she would be allowed to participate in the July 2016 class. Yes, she was only home for six months and then she was off again. And she just recently completed that internship in December of 2016. And that brings us to today. And all I can say is, God has changed her. She is not the young lady that we said goodbye to in Atlanta two years ago. She is fierce. She's fierce about her faith and about her walk with God. She's going to speak to us today with a spirit of authority, God's authority that he has given her because of what he has taught her. Not only about herself, but about the gifts that he has entrusted her with to use for his glory. Em, 
I'm so proud of you. I'm amazed by your strength and your courage to answer God's call and to leave what was comfortable, what was familiar, what was safe in order to become a true disciple of Christ. It's been two years now, and I want you to know that I really loved you when you began this journey, but I really, really love who you've become. And it is my honor to introduce you to our daughter, Emily McAllister. Hello, hello, hello. <clears throat> I've been trying not to cry all day, and she got me again. <clears throat> I heard that once already. Okay. I am so honored to have the privilege to share my heart with you this morning. I've leaned in, and I've listened to the still, sweet voice of Jesus, and wow, what an adventure it's been. Um, I said it last year, and I'll say it again. If you think that life with Jesus is boring, then you're not doing it right. You are missing something because it is so far from boring. Um, so from 11 countries and 11 months to living on the coast of Spain for six months, which I can tell you did not suck. Uh, life has not been dull these past two years. I've grown, I've learned, I have fought, and I have cried with thankfulness at the goodness of God. So where to begin? Uh, last year, with Dad beside me, I shared with you my very real, very vulnerable story. I told you about my ups and my downs, my struggle with depression, um, but also the continued goodness of God. I finished that morning by asking for your help yet again as I traveled to Spain for G42. Today, I want to share with you a little bit more about my journey and what it looks like to just be obedient. Um, it's not always easy, but it is always, always worth it. Uh, I want to continue being as transparent as I can be <clears throat> because life in a foreign country can be very hard despite waking up to the Mediterranean Sea every day. Um, I arrived in Spain excited and very nervous to begin this new journey, but I was expectant of what God was going to do um, and how he was going to move. I was about to meet my July class, who I would spend the next six, month with, next six months with. Uh, there were 10 of us. They were incredible. Um, my class was amazing, and we hit it off so well, but it still took me a while to find my groove in Spain. There was a lot of spiritual attack. Um, I believe that Satan knew that these six months were going to impact my life, and he did everything he could in that first semester to stop any growth from happening. Depression hit really hard in those first three months. Looking back, I can really see uh, how depression was keeping me from connecting with the previous interns and then also my own class. Despite the depression, however, class was incredible, um, overwhelming and amazing. Think of a time where you just sat and had good, mind-blowing truth just smack you upside the head. I mean, like, stop you in your tracks, mouth hanging open. You see the world different, and your life has been changed, and colors look different, and everything's flipped upside down. Um, this insane revelation moment of truth and that's what class was. And it was four days a week, six hours a day. It was exhausting. Um, but it was incredible. So when we had Friday and Saturday and Sunday off, I'm, seriously, it was to comprehend what we had just learned and then prepare to go into another week. There were some weeks we would come home, some days we'd come home from class and just, I mean, I would literally go upstairs and just stare at a wall, a white wall, because I didn't need anything else coming into my brain. It was so much. Um, it was theologically deep, bare bones every day. I absolutely loved it. Um, in that first three months, I learned, most importantly, that I was born to be loved. Andrew Sherman, the founder, this is his life's message. This is his heart story. This is why G42 was founded. Um, it sounds so simple, but think about it. You were born to be loved. You were not born to be a missionary. You were not born to be a pastor. You were not born to be an accountant, and you were not born to worship, and that one will get you. But you were born to be loved, to simply be loved by the creator who made you because he wants to spend time with you. 
just to love you. And we can pack up and go home. But I actually learned a lot more than that. I learned how important it is to look at the reality of your circumstance to find true healing. When your leg is broken, you don't ignore it. You go to the doctor, and then he sets it, and then it heals properly because you recognized my leg is broken. Had you ignored it, then it would have healed funky, and it would never be the, never be the same because you just didn't pay any attention to it. And it's the same in our lives. It's the same in your spiritual life. Look at your reality. Are you in debt? Recognize that. Are you depressed? Recognize that. Are you happy? Because recognize that too. When we recognize our circumstance for what it is, then your healer can come in and he can set it and it can heal properly the way that he wants it to. And then you can move on, truly healed. He can begin to heal and mend and do whatever he needs to do to make you whole again. Then you can walk out of that storm truly healed and truly set free, having learned and grown stronger in the process, ready to attack the next storm. Because you cannot avoid the storms of life. They are going to come, but you can decide how you handle those storms. I learned about freedom. I learned how freedom looks a lot less like running free and doing whatever you want and a lot more like personal responsibility. What do I mean by that? Jesus wants to do life with you. He created you with a personality, with burdens, and with passions. You get to choose whether you step into that or not. You choose whether you make a difference. Children and slaves do what they're told. But being free means stepping into maturity. It means taking ownership of your part of your relationship with God. Why do you think God uses marriage as an example of his relationship with you? Because in a relationship, it's two people coming together to love one another. Two people moving together. Both are responsible for the relationship to nurture it and to care for it and to help it grow. So you should also grow in spiritual maturity and take personal responsibility in the freedom that God has given you. God will love you regardless. That's agape love. The song called me higher. The lyrics say, I could could hold on. I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe. I could be safe here in your arms and never let these walls down. But you have called me higher and you have called me deeper. God will love you if you choose to stay where you are. He will love you if you choose to never move, but why would you want to? When you sing those words, you're recognizing that God is calling you into a relationship with him to grow and to mature. Did you ever think that God may know your every thought, but sometimes he just wants to know what you think. He just wants you to talk back to him. He created you to think. He loves your mind. He loves the way you think. You're the only you that he has. So use the mind that he gave you. How beautiful is that? As you can see, my first three months were very hard, but they were incredible. I learned to be me to take part in this journey and step into this relationship, to have conversation. What do I like? What do I want? This is what I like. This is what I want. What are my passions? And how did Jesus and I walk those out together? What what do we do from here? And guys, when you think that it's good, and I thought my relationship and my intimacy was good with the Trinity before I went to G42, and it just gets better. Like this life, life with Jesus, it's so sweet. It is the only thing that never gets worse. It never grows stagnant. It always gets better when you're continually pushing into that. I told you that I struggled getting to know um, and interact with the other interns. I connected with two of the previous interns. And even though I loved my class and they were incredible, there was still a wall around my heart. And it was very hard for me to be me even though I wanted to. I I just couldn't. I told several girls, I swear I'm fun. I have friends at home. They like me. They think I'm funny. I I don't know what's happening here, but I don't even want to be around me because I just suck. Um, And I couldn't figure out what the problem was. I was like the awkward third wheel. And think of a time that you were a third wheel and then like multiply it by 10. And that's how I felt. It was horrible. So The end of the semester came, and we had a two-week break before our second semester started. There were only three of us staying in Mijas. Everyone in my class was traveling. And two of them knew each other before they came to Spain. They did the world race together. So now I really am a third wheel and just was feeling it. Um, 
I was, and Satan was just magnifying all of my insecurities. I was a basket of comparison, insecurity, and depression. I didn't want to be around me at all. Um, but I tried to hang out anyway and just push in because, hello, I'm in Spain. This is what I'm here for. So I should probably hang out with you people. Um, so I tried, and I pushed in. Um, but my insecurity said they only invited me because they had to. So by Wednesday of that first week of break, I was miserable, and I just cried myself to sleep. For the next three days, I stayed away from everyone. I didn't interact at all, and I declined all invitations. And I fought with God the whole time, asking him, what in the world was the point? Why am I here? What is the point? Because if I can't connect with these people, then I don't, it's, I can't do this. I cannot do this another three months. I can't put them through it. I can't put me through it. I can't do it. So he and I argued, and then, you know, I told him I was going home, and obviously I didn't, but we fought. Um, so three days later, it was baking day, and we had already made plans at the beginning of that week to go to one of the community members' houses to bake, and I promised to go, so I went, and I didn't want to, but I did. Um, so we went baking, and it was okay. I was still weird, and it was ugh, but that was there. And then it was over, and I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And so we walked out, um, and me and the three other girls that I was with, we were kind of standing around. Uh, we were going to go watch American football that night at one of the pubs in town. Super pumped about that. But we had a couple hours to kill. So I started heading towards my house, and they kind of started heading this way. And so we decided we would just meet back up later. So I was like, oh, thank goodness. So we went our separate ways. And as I was on my way to my house, I stopped. And I thought, I can either sit at my house and be alone and wait till the football game, or I can turn around and try this thing again. I can, I can just as easily sit at home as I can sit with them. So I decided to push in one last time. So I got to Mikasa, and the girls were excited. They seemed excited. I, I wouldn't have been excited to see me, but they were happy that I turned around, and I was like, yeah, sure you are. So there I was, and uh, they started talking about food. And I needed to save money, um, and I wasn't really that hungry. So they went and got some food, and I thought, yes, every bit of this is working out like I want. I did not separate myself. I chose to turn around and dig into community, and they're leaving, and I get to be alone anyway. So I was super, super stoked. So they left, and I just sat on the couch and was just hanging out and, you know, minding my own business, playing on my phone. I uh, had no intention to spend time with Jesus. I was ticked at him because, uh, you know, sometimes you get mad. So I was like, leave me alone. So I sat on the couch, and I was just minding my own business, goofing around my phone. And then out of nowhere. The song Winter Snow by, uh, that Alyssa sang the previous Christmas popped into my head. And that doesn't make any sense because it was not cold in Spain yet. And, but out of nowhere it came on my mind. So, and you know that moment you hear the song and you're like, I have to listen to this. So I went on YouTube and I found it and I listened to it. And so then as I was listening to that one, then the song Pieces by Bethel came onto my mind. And I was off of their new album. Now, those songs don't suggest each other on YouTube, so I'm not sure how that happened. And that was the only song on that album that I hadn't really honed into. So I didn't even really know it. And then it popped into my head. So that didn't make any sense. But I had to listen to it. So I went and listened to that one. And as I was listening to this song, I, I cannot even explain to you. But it was just, bam, and the spirit just fell like so heavy and so thick, but at the same time, so freeing and so light. And suddenly I was bawling like a baby, snot flying everywhere. It was a mess. And I felt this weight fall off of me. And suddenly I could breathe. I felt like I had been holding my breath for weeks. And I just, I just inhaled. And this huge cloak of comparison and depression that had been weighing me down since I got there just slid off my shoulders and hit the floor. I felt light as a feather. I could breathe fresh air. I was laughing and crying at the same time. In the words, unrest unreserved, unrestrained, your love is wild for me. Your love is wild for me. It isn't shy. It's unashamed. Your love is proud to be seen with me.
shoot, they're so good. Um, so that song, his love is wild for me. Like, it's proud to be seen with me. So when I walk down the road and Jesus is walking with me, he's like, that's my girl. And I'm proud of her. And I'm like, suddenly I was like, I don't need to compare myself to these people. Because that's what I was doing. I was like, they're more spiritual than I am. You know, they're, they're smarter than me. They're funnier than me. They're more fun than I am. They have more experience. And then suddenly God was like, no, they don't. They have a life that I have created for them. And you have a life that I have created for you. So stop trying to be them. Be you. And stop comparing yourself. And it was huge. And I was like, well, duh. So I got up. And I went to the football game at the pub that night. And I am telling you, you can ask the three girls who were there that I met. I walked in a completely different person. I had color to my face. I was lighter and brighter. I had confidence. I was me. And they were like, who in the heck is this person? Because we don't know her, but what's up? And I was like, hey, how's it going? And I just walked in and I was smiling because I had experienced true healing because I had recognized my reality, no longer weighed down by comparison. I recognized what my reality was and I let the healer come in and do the work that he needed to do. Now, I fought comparison before and honestly, I still don't know why that was something we had to go through again in my first three months. But I can tell you, that nothing takes you out faster than comparing your life in any aspect to somebody else's. Your job, your parenting, your adventures, your possessions, your spiritual maturity. Comparison is the thief of all joy. Comparison, it will destroy you. Please, if you hear nothing else, hear that. Comparison will choke every last bit of life out of you and leave you gasping for air. So going into our second semester, I was a whole new person. I was lighter, I was brighter, I was confident. I had taken what I had learned in the first semester and applied it, and I stepped in with authority. I was super excited for my July class to come back from their travels. I suddenly missed them and wanted to be with them. We openly welcomed the October class. We were so excited to have them. And we just came together as two classes, just eager and ready for the Holy Spirit to come in. Uh, Every day we started class, we would stand and declare victory and new revelation over our day. Simply asking Holy Spirit to show up and show off. And man, he did. We had no idea. During several of our classes, uh, the teachers started teaching But then someone would be like, I just need to pray for this person. And so then next thing we knew, we were all praying for each other and crazy things were happening. And then it was like class was over and then we came back and we did it again. And it was like, what? And how does it happen several times? How do you have those, you know, spiritual moments several times? It's because Holy Spirit likes to hang out with us and he likes to be in the room with you and he likes to spend time with you. And when you allow him to do that, it's incredible. So a lot of healing happened. Having heard many of the teachers, the first term, a lot of them will come back and they teach the second term. And it's a lot easier to take it in the second time because you know them and you've heard them speak before. So even if they're saying something different, I know your heart and I've sat with you and I know you. So class, the second term wasn't as like, oh man, ah, okay, ah, I need to go sit home and like not think about anything. Um, That only happened twice the second term, which was so great. Because we got to really hang out with the October term and get to know them. Um, Not only, uh, so we were bonding together, the October class and the July class, um, and it was incredible. And last year when I spoke with Dad, I mentioned that I've struggled in my relationship with Christians. I've been hurt so many times, and that's really soured me. Um, But these people in Mijas, this family, this tribe that Jesus brought together, they healed my heart. Uh, specifically during one week, we were praying over one another, and one of the girls, she was an October term uh, intern, and she was praying over me, and she said that she saw a picture of my heart and that I had been hurt. And suddenly, Jesus showed me a picture of my heart, and it was held together by duct tape and staples and Band-Aids. It was barely beating, I mean, just enough to keep me alive. And then Holy Spirit came in and touched it. And all the broken places healed with strips of gold. And I was reminded of this article I read about Japanese pottery. And when the pottery breaks, when they take it to be mended, they mend it with gold. So all the broken places are still visible 
but now they're mended with something with so much more value than what it even had in the first place. So now my heart was mended with the pieces of gold. And I could see all of the, play, all the things that I had been through, but now my story has all of this value and God has brought it, brought me through storms and things that I have weathered and now I have a story and now I have something I can speak from and authority to speak into other people's lives because you can see in my heart and in my story that I have been broken and that God has brought me through it. So this place, this tiny pueblo in Spain, these people from all walks of life who just gave up everything to move here and say yes to Jesus, they healed my pain, truly healed me because I recognized the circumstance for what it was. So we graduated in December with many tears. Uh, it was truly heartbreaking to end this season. These people got into my heart, um, and I had to, had to grieve a great loss. Um, and that's just life. Sometimes you're grieving and you're rejoicing at the same time. It was so hard to say goodbye to them despite being so excited for the future and what's to come. And you would think, having done this as many times as I've done it, that I'd be better at it. But nope, I still suck at it. So there's that. Um, so what's next? So many of you have asked me, what am I doing next? You've asked me what my next trip is. Um, and now I can officially tell you that my next trip will be down the aisle to embark on a new journey <laughs> with my best friend. Yeah. He's so cute. <laughs> I'm just like my dad. It's great. Um, I cannot wait to begin this journey with Tony as God leads us and continues to teach us more about his love through loving each other um, in this completely new way. Um, I'm also excited, excited to begin working towards my bachelor's in psychology. I'll be getting that, begin that in 2018. And that really stems from... Uh, a teacher who came, and his name was Jerome, and he did, he talked about some things, and it's way up there, and I, I can't do it justice, but it was incredible, and I was on my seat the whole week, and I didn't sleep, I don't think at all, because I was just constantly thinking about what he's teaching, um, and so I'm super excited about that, uh, and God doesn't like to give me all the plans at once, because I have a tendency to try to control things, oh, I know where you're going with this, I'm just gonna go over here, and Jesus is like, nope, 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 nope. So he's only giving me that small piece, so I'm not really sure how that's gonna play in, but I am so excited, and I can't wait to continue following where he leads and just watch my dreams come true. Um, so many incredible things coming up. I am so blessed. It's unbelievable. Words cannot describe my gratitude um, to this church for the support that you've shown me, for the opportunities and the experiences that I have had the privilege of being able to have um, and the impact that those opportunities are having on my future. Uh, I struggle. I still struggle and I still get mad and I still get frustrated and I still stress about things. Uh, I still fight comparison and I still fight depression. But then I sit down and I look at my life and I just cry because God is so good. He is so good. And he can get you from one place to another and sometimes you don't even know how you got there. But you're like, man, I'm really happy I'm here. This is a great place to be. Um, and that's kind of where I am. So I want to leave you with this. If I've learned anything in all my travels, it's simply that we all truly have one desire, no matter what country or time zone you live in. We only have one need, to know that we are loved, that we are wanted, and that we are worthy of pursuit. So please know, beyond anything else, that you were born to be loved, that the Father looks at you with such joy and such adoration. You are the only you that he has. He didn't make another you. So be you. Uh, thank you so much for letting me share with you today. Well, I'm not exactly sure how to follow that up. <laughs> She's amazing, isn't she? If you're a parent uh, and you have an older child, then hopefully you'll understand that uh, it's, you know, it's one thing when they're small and they just do what you tell them. 
and you watch them get saved and you watch them grow spiritually. But then they'll hit this age and it'll scare you. They'll hit that age when they have to have their own faith. It can't be yours. It can't be a parent's faith. You can't quite pass that baton. They have to, they have to experience Jesus all on their own. And, and they'll have to do that through hurt and pain and disappointment. And it will be tough as a parent to watch them go through those things, but it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it when you when you listen to them speak with such authority and power and passion about their relationship with Jesus. And then as a parent, the neat thing is you'll stand back and, and you'll think, you know, I, I don't think I had anything to do with that. That was just God and His goodness and His mercy. So what is it that causes people to leave the comfort of their home and travel all across the world and visit 11 countries in 11 months and sometimes literally to sleep in very deplorable situations and maybe get a shower, maybe not. Maybe get a bird bath, maybe not. Wasn't living at the Hilton. <laughs> what, what is it that would cause someone to, to die to themselves and to give to the kind of people that have absolutely nothing. What is it that would cause somebody to pack their bags and go to Spain for six months? It is just the love of Jesus. That's it. So I was kind of raised in the kind of environment where it was it was a religious environment and, and I don't think anybody meant any harm but but it was there was you, you give your life to Jesus and you understood the love of God and you knew John 3 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his son and you get that and that he was raised on the third day and that he died because he he loved you and God sent him because he loved you but then there's Somehow there was that thing, it was about serving and somehow you didn't serve enough and you had to do enough to try to please Him. And that is just such bad, bad theology. And if you could ever get to this place in your life when... that you can understand that His love is wild for you. Uncontrolled, unrestrained. And that He just wants to walk with you every day and love you. Just love you and be with you and to be proud of you. God, if you can get to that place in your life, you will be set free. Maybe you're here as a Christian this morning and somehow you've not experienced that. You just, you haven't quite experienced that. And maybe you've gotten caught up in religiosity and you've got on a performance treadmill and you've just been trying to please God and to make Him happy and to earn more of His love. I just wish this morning that you could hear, hear her words, not mine, but to hear the Holy Spirit's words. He says, I love you more than you can imagine. And nothing that you'll ever do or not do will ever change that. I'm crazy about you. Then serving and giving. Are you kidding me? That's nothing. It does, you don't even care anymore. It doesn't matter. Why would you not? Why would you not want to be with him? Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus, and maybe you're thinking, wow, I didn't know 
that the, I didn't. I thought you know it was about going to church and doing better and straightening up your life. I did, I didn't know. I missed the love thing. I missed that love of God thing. And if I had known that, I would have given my life to Jesus a long time ago. So if you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus, and you wonder how do I do that. Well, it's, it, part of that is believing the right stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that He went to the cross and died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and mine, that we're guilty. He's not. And He said, but I'm going to become guilt. I'm going to take your shame and all your guilt. I'm going to take that on me, and I'm going to take it to the cross. and I'm going to shed my blood to pay the penalty for it. It is to believe that on the third day that He's been raised from the dead. But it's more than believing the right stuff. It's just surrendering. And it's just saying, God, you know what? I want to spend the rest of my life walking with you. That's it. If that's you and you're not a follower of Jesus, but you'd like to be, then every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And maybe you just want to pray a simple prayer, something like this. You can use your own words. But if you need something to kind of help you, and then maybe you'd just say something like this. You'd say, Jesus, I just didn't know. I, I didn't really understand the depth of your love. I didn't know that your love was wild for me. I just didn't know. And I do believe. I believe you are exactly who you say you are. And I just want to give my heart away. I want to ask for your forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin. And for the rest of my life, I just want to follow you. Thank you for your love. Teach me more and more every day what your love means. Father, uh, it's been a wonderful day. Karen and I have been two incredibly proud parents. You have a call on her life. And Lord, I believe that you've brought this young man into her life and that together... They will experience incredible things because of you. They'll embrace you, Lord. They'll walk with you. Through the ups and the downs and the struggles of life, they'll be drawn closer to you and closer to each other. Use them, Lord. Use them up. Use them to show the world your love thank you Lord you're amazing and it's in your sweet name that we pray amen oh man hey you don't want to miss next week uh, I'm going to do something I've never done in the history uh, of, of the ministry I'm going to do uh, a series on the song of Solomon There's a few of you that have read the Song of Solomon. For those of you that have not, it's hot. <laughs> and if you think, oh, that's just preacher talk, this is Sunday, it can't be that hot, oh yeah. I would read a few verses, but I ain't going to do that. <laughs> It'll be difficult enough as we, but we're, listen, so if you're in a relationship, if you're dating, and you're not dating, but you want to be dating, you're not married, but you want to be married, you don't, you don't listen, I promise you don't want to miss this series. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, we're we're going to look at dating, and, and we're going to talk about conflict, because this is a wonderful, beautiful couple that actually had conflict, and how they worked through that, and so the next four weeks are going to be, they're going to be unbelievable, and you don't want to miss it, and you want to invite all of your unchurched friends, because I promise you, you're gonna, they're not going to believe this is in the Bible. I'm, I, listen, somebody's going to get offended. I, I promise you I'm going to get a nasty email. I can't believe you said that on Sunday morning. 
And I'm going to say, it was in the Bible. I just read what was there. Karen will probably not be here for those four weeks. She'll be scared to death of what all I might say. So you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss the next four weeks. And maybe today, you know what, uh, for whatever reason, you're struggling in your walk with God. You're trying to figure that whole walk out. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're not, but you're still, and maybe you're following Jesus. You don't even know it yet. You're already headed down that path. I want you to just want to, our family, we're here to kind of hang out and talk with you if that'll help. There'll be some other folks that'll be down here with badges and name tags and all that good stuff. And they're really professional and they probably know a lot more than we know. But we'll be here to love on you and help you. Uh, thank you so much for being so gracious to us. Thank you for your support and your love. Love you. You don't want to miss next week. Bye.